Today we're going to play Mark 1 Ford Escort with the 2 litre turbo and EFI. If you're liking this video so far and what I'm showing you, like and subscribe, there's more coming. Background story on this beast, it's been in the build for a while. The owner always wanted a 2 litre Pinto Turbo. Instructions are, here's the car, make it work, get it driving, get it tuned. So it looks like it's got a Sierra intake manifold, EFI system, a nice turbocharger on the side. If I look at the part numbers, it's a Garrett, looks like it's a T3, and I'll get some specifications a little bit later. External wastegate. We've got um, conversion to direct fire, so it's got uh, four ignition coils, one for each cylinder instead of the um, distributor. Alloy radiator. We've got a uh, front mounted intercooler. The information we've been given is uh, this engine in its almost current configuration has been on an engine dyno before being fitted to the vehicle. So it has already been running and it, run in and it is proven. There are some changes once, it, uh, once it's been put in the car. Now this vehicle on the dyno ran a distributor and a single coil ignition system. Now it's been converted to direct fire with four ignition coils. However, uh, after the conversions being made, the uh, changes haven't been made to the distributor pickup to allow running of four ignition coils. So when we attempted to run this car initially, we didn't get very far. We could see that it had the wrong signals to run four ignition uh, coils. So with a setup like this, what's normally run is we need a signal for each cylinder. We also need a signal to tell the computer that uh, number one cylinder is coming up next. That's how it works out the order. The engine management system we have on this vehicle, which you can partially see under the bracket, is an Autronic SM4. This used to be one of my all-time favorite units back in the day when it uh, first came out. It's still a very capable unit. I love working with these. Uh, the tunability with these units is, is, is as good as anything out these days. I've got my old school national timing light. This thing's an old beast powered by these D-sized batteries. It doesn't have the fancy features of my newer one, but where this one excels is where I want to look at timing at cranking speeds. It is wonderful because it's self-powered. It's got a good light and it's really good at uh, picking up RPM signals at, uh, at really low speeds. So I've got it clipped on to my number one lead. So I'm going to crank the car over. I'm going to look at the uh, pulleys uh, and look at my timing marks on the pulleys and the pointer on the engine block. And I want to be somewhere near my firing angle. So I'm expecting this thing to crank somewhere between say top dead center to maybe 10, 15 degrees before top dead center. Okay, Mark, crank. Two tips for dropping off cars for uh, tuning, especially a car that hasn't been run before or a system that you need to work out a few things on. At least half a tank of fresh fuel. A lot of guys come here with a car that they've been working on and, and the car's been off the road for a couple of years. They got some fuel in the tank, but it's old stale fuel, so it's really not going to help our case here. Uh, if that's the case, I don't know about this one. The second one that I'm coming to is have a good, strong, fresh battery. Because there's going to be a lot of cranking, a lot of stop-start type thing till the vehicle's sorted out. So we really need a good, strong battery. Uh, if you've got one, it really helps. Otherwise, it just slows the process down and it takes additional time 
to get everything correct. Three days have passed um, since we've recorded any footage on this car. We have had some success but it's still not at a point of where it's running. It's turned into a bit of a grey hair material where the more we work on it, uh, the more grey hairs I'm getting. So what's happened so far is um, we've had starter motor problems. So the starter motor had to come out. The old one um, had some sort of vibration and noise in it. Luckily we had a used one here that I could put into it because it's not the easiest thing finding a starter motor for this car ready to go, being the age of the car and age of the engine. After that, um, it managed to start on two cylinders. Uh, we, were, we were at the time under time pressure again, so I didn't have time to get the camera out to record that part of it. But then what we're down to now is uh, checking individual spark and then um, fuel and compression for each cylinder. Just find out why um, we don't have uh, anything going on in cylinders two and three. I seem to have it running on cylinder one and cylinder four nothing happening on two and three so to get an engine running we need three things we need fuel we need compression and we need spark so sparks there easy to measure fuel uh, electrically I've put a noid light on which flashes every time there's an injector pulse that comes in so I've got that so now we're checking compression so compression is looking good so far we've done the first three cylinders it's getting about 175 psi so what the compression test does is we've got a pressure gauge inside the cylinder and we crank the engine over and see how much cylinder pressure it uh, builds up so I'm gonna run through one test with you guys okay so cranking over yep okay about 170 psi there it is I don't know how good it is coming through Compression is good, good enough that we're between 165 to 175 psi across all four cylinders, so that's good. Now that I can see spark, I've got compression. With uh, injectors, I had a signal, but I can't be sure whether the injector's spraying. So the next step's going to be now removing the fuel rail and uh, testing the injectors on a test bench, and we'll see how that goes. I'll try to get some footage of that for you guys. It's been a few days since we've been filming. The little Escort now runs. Next, we're gonna do some um, more dyno tuning and some power runs. All right, she's uh, starting to sound slightly tappity. So maybe after this short dyno session, time to set the tappets. Fuel pressure looks good. For now, we're just running the boost. No boost controller directly to wastegate, which, um, is around 12 psi. Again on dyno tuning this is where the dyno has the great advantage compared to tuning it on the road because on the road it is pretty hard to determine what mixture works out the best. Sure on the road it would be good enough to get the car to a point where it runs smooth and feels smooth but I'll never be able to optimize it as well as I can on the dyno because I'm looking at both fuel mixtures here and, and, and the power it makes versus a fuel mixture that I run into the engine. So it really helps to pay off to do it on the dyno. I can get it far more accurate and much better result for the customer. Can I tune it on the road? Of course I can. And will I get it um, driving well enough on the road? Of course I can. To, um, to the person that's driving the car, they may not even be able to tell the difference there. But the engine will tell the difference. Your fuel economy numbers will tell the difference. On the dyno when we're mapping a car, we don't always have to map every single point. Once you've gotten the idea on a few different points across the, the map range that you're working with, you can then tell what the engine's going to like at the next map point. Some engines vary a lot from point to point. Some engines uh, remain fairly consistent. So what you've got to do is you need to map uh, enough number of points to work out the engine's character, what it likes in terms of fuel mixtures and ignition timing. And once you've got that worked out, then you can fill the rest of your tables in and be, be within 5% of where you've got to be. And then you go over it one more time to make sure that everything's 100% uh, to your liking. And this is how mapping's typically done on the dyno to get uh, the best results in terms of fuel economy and power. So the difference between fuel economy and power, uh, the, the strategies are a little bit different. 
when we're chasing power we're obviously dialing the mixture that makes the best power regardless of fuel economy and then fuel economy works the opposite we we dial in the mixtures that make the highest power with the least amount of fuel given and working on the trade-off of how much power we lose as we remove fuel because you can get to a point where let's say that if you pull 10% fuel out of the engine and then your power drops 20% at that point you need to think because um, you're actually losing fuel economy but because the engines lost that much power by pulling that 10% fuel out that you're going to now have to put your foot down further on the accelerator to maintain that power and load to maintain that speed or acceleration or whatever the engine happens to be doing at that time. Most modern cars on part throttle they don't follow that strategy that I've just explained. Because they're emissions controlled often the mixtures that are run are the ones that keep the catalytic converters happy and are the ones that produce the least amount of emissions irrespective of uh, fuel economy or, uh, or uh, power. So when you've got a car that's emissions controlled that being your number one priority everything else basically goes down the list and a lot of the uh, modern cars are then designed engine wise to be happy and run well at those uh, fuel mixtures that promote the best emissions. That's not always the case with performance engines especially engines with large camshafts. If you try to run lean enough mixtures to get emissions right you'll find that uh, a lot of those highly modified engines will get unhappy and it'll be a bit surgy, won't be smooth, will not feel nice to drive. Alright enough talk let's do a couple of power runs. I've got my maps uh, done enough that I can now do a full throttle pass on this engine so what I've done up to this point is uh, I've done 2000 rpm light load to, to nearly full throttle then I've done three four five thousand so I know my maps pretty good after I've seen what it does at three or four and five thousand I can have a good guess at what she's going to want at six and seven thousand so I've filled those points in and I'm ready for a power run Let's talk about the dyno and the power output. Here's our power graph from the power run that we've just done. So we've got 192 horsepower at the back wheels. These little engines, I think the RS2000 model was rated 100 horsepower at the, um, at the engine. So to the back wheels you'd be lucky to make 75 or 80 horsepower. This one's more than double that with the turbocharger and, and, and a few mods. So what we've got here is uh, on this axis we've got power so it goes from zero all the way up to uh, 200 horsepower on the bottom axis x-axis here I've got engine rpm from 2000 all the way to six and a half thousand and looking at the run I'm starting to run at about 2750 and then I'm going to about uh, 5750 engines making peak power at about 5250 rpms there it is there if I zoom back out a bit okay and on this axis here I've got boost pressure that the engine's running so I've got 0 5 10 15 so we're at about 12 13 psi peak and then uh, we're starting initially somewhere around 7 or 8 psi at uh, 2800 so it's already making pretty good boost at that low rpm and uh, if we look at the power at that 2750 2800 rpm point we're already about 80 90 horsepower at the back wheels what this standard engine probably wouldn't have even made at redline at uh, at flat out so performing quite well i'm going to go on now look at my logs i'm going to look at um how my ignition timing is going i'm going to look at how my injector duty is going i've got 600 cc injectors which should allow me plenty of power so I should be somewhere around 50% duty at this point so I've got plenty of injectors left so I'm going to go and look at how things are running but overall I am happy with this start and uh, we were running at 12 psi once we get the boost controller hooked up we should be able to run more boost so I'm 190 horsepower 12 psi working back that's probably about 230 ish 240 ish horsepower at the engine uh, I've been told that this engine's made about 300, 330 horsepower on the engine dyno, but I'm pretty sure it wouldn't have been uh, at 12 psi boost. 
this is just our start the boost control is not hooked up just yet i'd be keen to give it another run with a little bit more boost but i just don't have the equipment to do it right now okay for this episode round one on the escort we're nearly there i'm out of time and space with the car for now i am going to have it back so i will do a round two so if you've liked it like and subscribe and we'll see you with episode two with the uh, mark one escort and the two liter pinto